Of all the underrated movies in existence, I think the one that baffles me the most is Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides. For some reason, this movie has a very negative reputation. Many people even call it the worst of the Pirates franchise. And not only do I strongly disagree with both statements, I am utterly baffled as to how and why people even think this in the first place. I mean, have they even watched the movie? It's fantastic! You'd need a magnifying glass to actually spot any real flaws in this movie. Nice. At least from what I could tell, Pirates of the Caribbean is one of my favorite film franchises, and there aren't any... Uh, wait, actually, no, there's one bad movie. But it's not this one. Strange as it may seem, though, for some reason, most of the movies in the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise have mixed or negative reception. In fact, the only one that seems to be universally liked is the first one, which I don't even think is the best one, which is Dead Man's Chest, by the way. However, as I said, with the exception of that one movie, all the Pirates movies are actually good in my opinion, and the only real reasons why I could understand why some people might not like them is that they do go over the top in a lot of places. Maybe the pirate theming isn't for everyone, or Jack Sparrow is just too weird for them, but I don't know who would ever say that since he's quite easily one of the most iconic cinema characters ever invented. But none of those points have anything to do specifically with On Stranger Tides, but rather just the movie franchise in general. In fact, the only real evidence I ever hear anyone bring up as to why this movie isn't good is usually something along the lines of it didn't have Will Smith and Elizabeth <laughs> Will Smith <laughs> Oh, that's hot. That's hot It didn't have Will Turner and Elizabeth Swan Blackbeard wasn't a great villain It was just a random side story and other such vague comments that don't really point out anything in particular in the actual movie First of all, how does Will Turner and Elizabeth Swan not being in the movie make this a lesser movie? I mentioned in a brief blurb in my Toy Story 2 video that I didn't think it was a very good sequel But that it was a good movie anyways and Will Turner and Elizabeth Swan is one of the main things I was referring to with that text since on Stranger Tides in general doesn't really follow up that much from the first three movies. However, you don't have to be a good sequel to be a good movie, which leads me to the next point, that it's just a random side story, which, once more, doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. Why can't the movie just be a random side story? If the story is good and worth telling, which in my opinion, this one is, but I'll explain why in a bit, because first we must address the third point, that being that some of the characters aren't great supposedly. I mainly mentioned Blackbeard because that's when I hear the most complaints about, but I first want to talk about a couple other characters who are significantly better than people give them credit for. First on the docket, Jack Sparrow himself. Now I know what you're thinking. No one complains about Jack Sparrow, Rockotar. Why bring him up? Well, firstly, there's always going to be a few people who complain about him, no matter what movie it is. And second of all, my point is more so that we, the audience, didn't realize how good we had it in this movie until Dead Men Tell No Tales came out, in which they utterly botched and borderline assassinated his character. Almost everything he does in that movie is out of character, and he never says any iconic lines. Unlike this movie, where we get legendary stuff like, You are Jack Sparrow. There should be a captain in there somewhere. You've stolen me, and I'm here to take myself back. You know that feeling you get sometimes when you're standing in a high place? A sudden urge to jump? I don't have it. A few moments later. <laughs> Meanwhile. Not to mention these cannonballs. 18 pounds each, they say. One legged man with 18 pound balls? That's why he walks. Please laugh. We are very funny. My ultimate point being, Jack Sparrow is a fantastic character, and he's just as good in this movie as he was in the previous three, and because he's such a great character, it's part of the reason why I feel that it's not necessarily required to have Elizabeth Swan and Will Turner for the movie to actually be good, since Jack can stand on his own as protagonist. Next up on the docket we have Angelica, who you could say fills in the missing spot of Will Turner and Elizabeth Swan. She's more or less the second most important character in this movie 
movie, although you could argue that's Barbosa, but we'll get to him in a second. If I had to pick out of the most important characters in this movie who the least interesting character is, I might pick Angelica, but that's not really saying much because all the main characters in this movie are pretty interesting. She basically serves as the link between Jack Sparrow and Blackbeard, and also gives us a glimpse into Jack Sparrow's past, something not touched upon too much in the previous movies, once more reinforcing the idea that we don't really need Will Turner and Elizabeth Swan for this to be a good movie, since all the stuff with Jack Sparrow is so interesting on its own. Her interactions with Jack Sparrow are all very entertaining, and part of why this is is because she's essentially just like Jack in a lot of ways. Jack himself even claims to have been the one to have taught her much of her ways. Jack is already more of a morally great character than most main characters you find in film franchises, and Angelica also falls somewhere in the moral gray zone, but much further on the negative side than the positive compared to Jack Sparrow, which is the main reason why their interactions are so interesting. Two similar characters from a similar background with different ideas of how they go about doing things in the world. I also find it perfectly fitting that because she parallels Jack in a lot of ways, that she also dresses up as Jack near the beginning of the movie. And then there's Blackbeard himself, Angelica's father, and as I briefly mentioned, he's the one that I usually hear the most complaints about character-wise, but honestly, I don't really see it. People usually say that he's the worst villain of the franchise, or at least that's what they used to say until Salazar came along. But if you really stop and think about it, is that really much of a bad thing, considering how good the villains in this franchise are? While I will agree that he is probably the weakest, except Salazar, he's still a pretty great villain, and it's a bit unfair to compare him to the likes of Davy Jones, who is quite possibly one of the greatest villains in cinema history. I think the writers knew that they were never really going to top that. And giving us another character with a deep and tragic backstory and depth of motivations would have probably been a bit samey right after Davy Jones. See, Blackbeard was never meant to be a deep villain. I mean, there's a scene where he just flat out says, No, sir, the truth is he'd be much simpler than all that. I'm a bad man. And that's all he really needs to be for the story to work. And boy, when he does become that bad man he claims to be, he is certainly one of the most intimidating villains in this franchise. In fact, in any franchise. And though I say he's a more simple villain, I think he's also given several moments of great characterization throughout the movie. Not only is he evil and cruel, but secretly, deep down underneath all that, he's actually more of a coward. He insults people and mocks them to make them feel lesser than himself, so he can always put himself on the top. Whenever someone tries to call him out, such as with the preacher character, he tries to one-up them with even more insults and mockery. And if that doesn't work, he'll probably just kill them. But the thing is, if he didn't have his magic sword and his powerful crew and dangerous reputation, no one would like him and no one would serve him. So I actually think he's a pretty great character and certainly one of the most underrated in this movie. And the last character I want to shed a spotlight on is, of course, Barbosa, like Jack Sparrow, also returns in this movie. I mean, there are other characters I could also touch upon, such as Mr. Gibbs, who also returns. I mean, the part where he eats the map is hilarious. Oh wait, that only happened in the LEGO game, didn't it? Oh, but wouldn't it have been amazing if Kevin McNally actually ate the map on screen? Scrum, who's pretty great, and the one good thing Dead Men Tell No Tales did was bringing him back and actually doing him right compared to some other characters. The preacher guy who I keep blanking on the name of, who's pretty decent as well. Or Serena, the mermaid. But I haven't got all day and I don't want to go on and on and on. So anyways, Barbosa is another character who's very great in this movie. He's lost everything, his ship, his crew, his leg even, and all of that to Blackbeard. And his main goal throughout this movie is pretty much revenge, which I actually find a very fitting and interesting goal for Barbosa in this movie, since I think he's the type of character who would definitely be motivated to go for revenge in this situation. But it's not just any old, I'm mad, I want revenge, I'm gonna kill you all kind of revenge, as Barbosa still has that witty charm he had in all the previous movies. His type of revenge is more like when someone cheats you in a game and you desperately want to get back at them to make it even again. And it's a perfectly fitting finale for Barbosa that Blackbeard took everything from him, so therefore he takes everything from Blackbeard. So as you can see so far, I've already pointed out several moments of great character writing, but you know what else is written very well? The plot. The story of this movie is actually quite interesting on a number of levels as well. But first I'll have you know that this is a movie about Jack Sparrow, and thus the plot is designed to focus on and work
work around him. Personally, I have no problem with this, but this seems to be the main criticism of several people lunged towards this movie. But this movie was never really meant to be the true successor to the following three movies, but more so of a side story. And I think it's not very accurate to criticize this movie for just focusing on Jack Sparrow and not following up anything from the other previous movies. Sure, that makes it not a good sequel, but that has nothing to do with the actual story being told in this movie. This movie is best if viewed essentially as a Jack Sparrow side spin-off movie on its own, rather than connected to the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise as a whole. And the fact that it's only about Jack Sparrow is not a bad thing in my opinion, because the story being told is still interesting enough, and this is most definitely a story worth being told in my opinion. One reason that I'm not actually that bothered about Will Turner and Elizabeth Swan not being in the movie is how well their character arcs were concluded in the previous movie anyways, and that it would actually kind of be difficult to have them in this movie. I mean, they were barely even in Dead Men Tell No Tales anyway, due to the nature of the curse and whatnot, making it hard to actually have them do much. Whereas with Jack Sparrow, you could pretty much do anything with his character. He's the kind of character who will always have more adventures to unfold. And his character arc, so to speak, is never really set in stone. Although I think this movie does a good job of adding to his character without changing anything. But anyways, not only is a story about the Fountain of Youth very interesting on its own, but this one is particularly well told. Much of that comes down to the exceptionally good pacing of the movie, as well as a great atmosphere. When it comes to the subject of pacing, this this movie always keeps you interested and engaged throughout by drip feeding you important bits of information when they're most relevant or will add the most tension to the story. For example, when it comes to the actual quest for the Fountain of Youth itself, Jack Sparrow doesn't exactly know what you have to do to get to the Fountain of Youth and what you have to do to actually use the Fountain of Youth. But these bits of information are later brought to us through other characters, primarily Angelica, and these bits of information are only given to us one at a time so that we can better focus on the story story and each individual event that's happening at any one time. If they just exposition dumped all the information about the Fountain of Youth at the beginning of the movie, it would make the movie way more boring and uninteresting because it would just feel like delaying the inevitable until we got to the end. But this movie makes sure to only give you just as much information as you need at any one given time. Like how Jack later learns that you need a mermaid's tear to actually use the Fountain of Youth. And later we learn from a group of sailors' perspectives that the very mention of the word mermaid sends shivers down most people's spines. And this mix of information now gives us the known knowledge to be afraid when Jack Sparrow goes to actually capture a mermaid with Blackbeard's crew. It is ultimately paid off in the scene where the terrifying mermaids attack the crew, in what is quite possibly the most horrifying scene in all of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. But of course, that's part of what makes it so amazing. The mermaid capturing scene is also later paid off even further by the scene where Blackbeard actually tries to get the tear itself from the mermaid. Like, can't we just appreciate how clever of a villain Blackbeard is here. I love how Blackbeard tricks Serena into thinking that he wanted her to cry because he killed the preacher, only for it to turn out that he never intended to kill the preacher, but just leave him almost dead, so that when she realizes he's still alive, she'll cry tears of joy instead. These are the kind of villainous moves that just make you hate the villain even more than you already did before. And they're part of why I actually think Blackbeard is a pretty good villain, and I don't really get the hate for him. Like seriously, why do some of you guys hate Blackbeard as a villain? I mean, come on guys. Not being as good as one of the greatest villains in cinematic history doesn't mean you're automatically bad. But anyways, back to my original point. There are several other examples of what I'm trying to say about how the plot constantly adds more elements throughout to keep the pacing fresh and always keep you engaged so that you never know too much. It's also from Angelica that we hear that the Fountain of Youth doesn't just give life, it also requires taking a life in order to give life to the other person, which is given to us at a point in the story when it seems like the worst of it is behind us, so that way we still have a sense of dread on the back of our mind. And then there's the atmosphere of this movie, and I think this is easily the most atmospheric out of all the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, and in fact quite possibly one of the most atmospheric movies I've ever seen in my entire life. The sense of mystery, adventure, and dread throughout this entire movie is actually quite unique from any other movie I've ever seen, and it's really effective and immersive, the mystery and intrigue being the most important of these atmospheric elements in my opinion. So many scenes 
things are set at night, I'd often have a lot of mist or fog around, which really helped to create that mysterious atmosphere. I mean, there's just something about mist and fog that's inherently mysterious for some reason. And just all the locations in this movie in general are really great. This is easily the most expensive and high-budget looking Pirates of the Caribbean movie, and honestly, I'd be pretty shocked if someone told me Dead Men Tell No Tales was actually more expensive to make because it looks worse than this movie. Like, this is just one of the best looking movies I think I've ever seen in my life. Another aspect that also adds to the amazing atmosphere of this movie is the soundtrack. All the Hans Zimmer Pirates of the Caribbean soundtracks are amazing, but I think this one might just be my favorite, as it really adds so much to the mood and feel of every scene. Blackbeard's theme and the mermaid themes are particular standouts. Oh, and the Fountain of Youth theme, too. I feel like this is the one aspect of the movie that no one would dare criticize. But anyways, I'm starting to get sidetracked. I was supposed to be talking about the plot, wasn't I? Another aspect that makes this plot so great, in my opinion, is all the different character motivations. One thing I really like about Jack Sparrow's motivation in this movie is that he doesn't necessarily want the Fountain of Youth so that he can live forever, but just so that he can brag about being the one who found it. Although I'm sure his motivations might have been different originally, and he started to change his mind along the way after discovering how much you actually have to go through to get to the Fountain of Youth, and the cost it actually takes to use it. And Angelica is sort of similar in the fact that she doesn't necessarily want the Fountain of Youth for herself, though she does seem more interested in it than someone like Jack, drawing more parallels between the two. Her primary interest is that she gets to the Fountain of Youth to help her father, Blackbeard, be able to use it to save his life from an inevitable death. And then there's Barbosa, who has pretty much no interest in the Fountain of Youth whatsoever, and simply just wants his revenge on Blackbeard. And lastly, you have the Spanish, who want the Fountain of Youth not to actually use it for themselves, but to prevent anyone from using it. This mix of different character motivations is part of what makes the plot of this movie so interesting. I like that not everyone actually wants to use the Fountain of Youth, and in fact, the only one who really does is Blackbeard, who wants to save himself from dying. One thing I really love about the Fountain of Youth is that you don't just drink its waters and live forever, but that there has to be a cost. Someone has to pay for your life with theirs. And all this ultimately culminates in one of the best climaxes to any of these Pirates movies. Although, to be honest, they all have pretty good climaxes. Even Dead Men Tell No Tales to a lesser extent. Actually, before I talk about the climax, I almost forgot to mention all the great action sequence in this movie, which is another thing this movie does so great. Pretty much all the action sequences in this movie are amazing and some of the best in all these movies. The London escape sequence is just the right level of over-the-topness for these Pirates of the Caribbean movies. It's extremely crazy, but they don't go too far, landing it just right in that sweet zone that I like. Blackbeard's awakening, so to speak, is an epic and a terrifying sequence, and also I already mentioned the mermaid sequence, another terrifying sequence, but also just as good, if not better. Oh, and also the Angelica and Jack Sparrow fight near the beginning of the movie, I almost forgot about that one. The palm tree escape sequence, legendary stuff right there. And of course, the climactic final battle of this movie, pirates versus pirates versus Spanish. Actually, the Spanish don't actually do that much, they pretty much show up, blow up the fountain of youth and peace out. But it's still an epic battle between the pirates. And I love that Barbosa isn't so much a gentleman that he isn't willing to stab Blackbeard while he isn't looking, taking advantage of the craziness of the situation that's unfolding. And it's perfect, too, that Blackbeard would be so distracted by the potential of the Fountain of Youth being destroyed that he wouldn't notice his foe getting up to stab him. In being so worried about saving his own life, his paranoia of keeping himself alive is ultimately what gets him killed in the end. Ironic leaving us with the excellent, outstanding, quite possibly the greatest scene in this movie, final scene. Well, I say the final scene, but there's a couple other scenes after this, but you know what I mean. This is the apex of the story, the boiling point, what everything has built up to. Since Barbosa didn't really care about the Fountain of Youth, he's already left. The Spanish have seemingly succeeded in their goal of preventing anyone from using it, but there's just enough water left to actually fill up the two cups. Angelica, in her attempt to save her own father, also ends up paying the price by getting poisoned by Barbosa's sword. Angelica immediately offers up her life before she passes away to save her father. And Blackbeard, of course, readily accepts this, since, in truth, he never really did care much for Angelica. He even put her in mortal danger before with his whole seven guns, two loaded thing. Jack Sparrow, of course, knows this, so he pulls a card out of Blackbeard's own sleeve, just like how Blackbeard tricked Serena into giving out her tear by making her believe that he was going to do one thing only for his plan to actually be something else instead. Jack Sparrow plays the fool and pretends that the tear is in the opposite cup that it actually is 
is in so that Blackbeard will drink the cup without the tear, knowing that his greed will cause him to grab that one, since there's no way Jack Sparrow is actually gonna let Blackbeard get near immortal life, much less outlive himself. And then of course, as he walks away, he reveals the uh, truth of the situation. But it's already too late at that point, and Blackbeard is literally disintegrated by the water of the fountain. Sheesh, that's two movies in a row I've reviewed on this channel where the villain dies a gruesome death. But once more, I kind of love it. He definitely deserved it in this case, just like the Horned King in the Black Cauldron. And this is a perfectly fitting and poetic end to the Fountain of Youth story, in that the only one who greedily wanted to use the Fountain of Youth to extend his life is the only one who ends up paying with his life by the end of the story. Ironic. Seriously, guys, why is this movie hated by so many people? I don't understand it. And then we get a few epilogue final scenes where Barbosa is on Blackbeard's ship and takes command. Jack Sparrow drops off Angelica on an island to live out the rest of her supposed days, although she will probably escape. And there's also that end credit scene where she finds the Jack Sparrow voodoo doll. I doubt we'll actually ever get a follow-up to this end credit scene. And then, of course, there's one last scene of Jack Sparrow and Mr. Gibbs reuniting and walking off into the sunset on the beach, which honestly is a pretty good final scene for the entire franchise if you think about it, especially since Dead Men Tell No Tales is, you know, not exactly a great follow-up. And well, that pretty much brings a close to the movie. And with all my points combined that I've made throughout this video, I believe this movie to not only be not bad, not even just good, but great, amazing, fantastic a really solid movie through and through. The reputation this movie has is nothing short of baffling. It's confounding. I genuinely don't get most of the criticisms. In fact, most of the criticisms I've heard are barely even criticisms at all. It's like people want to dislike this movie, but there's almost nothing you can actually point to as disliking in it. Maybe some people just didn't like the movie because it was different from the other Pirates of the Caribbean movies or, or some such nonsense like that. I mean, first of all, it's not even that different. And second of all, why is being different a bad thing? I think one of Dead Men Tell No Tales' faults is that it tried too hard to be like the first three movies, and it fell flat on its face. Whereas this movie actually tried to be different, and in my opinion, succeeded with flying colors. Well, hopefully this video will have convinced some of you out there to give this movie another shot. I think it's far better than most of you actually realize. If you watch this movie as more of a standalone movie and not as part of the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise as a whole, and don't focus too much on what's not in the movie, like Will Turner and Elizabeth Swan, and instead focus on how good the movie is at what it's attempting to do in the first place. Tell a great story about Jack Sparrow, the Fountain of Youth, and Blackbeard. And I think you'll find that it's actually quite fantastic. I believe Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides is a great movie. And I will die on this hill. <laughs>